In the last lecture, we discussed the social construction reality. In lecture two, we're going to talk about studying symbolic interaction. If people are constantly negotiating meaning with one another, how do we study it in an empirical way? First, you must put away any biases, existing meanings that you may have. This is important because empirical is not necessarily scientific, at least not like traditional sciences like biology or chemistry. While you may believe that those types of disciplines are more rigorous than the social sciences, they also have weaknesses. The methods reviewed in this lecture will give you the tools to study people the rest of your life without any access to labs or sophisticated computers. It also doesn't cost very much money. It will likely take you a lot of time, but it is very doable. I suspect that some of you already do it. This lecture will help you be a better people watcher. The value of qualitative methods. While there are many symbolic interactions to utilize quantitative methods like surveys or experiments, almost all of them value the importance of qualitative methods like observations, for instance ethnographies, and personal interviews. In a culture which values the hard sciences, why might this be the case? Consider the picture in the slide. What is going on? To anyone living in the Western culture, it is clear that it is a man making an unwanted, unwanted advance on a woman. It may also be apparent that the man is using his privilege as a man and may be a supervisor to do so. How could you reproduce this kind of interaction in a lab? A man may be assigned the role of a bad boss who harasses someone, but there are limits to what he can do, and it would likely produce a very different reaction among female subjects than if it happened in a natural setting. It is difficult to know, but by observing and talking to people who experience harassment in the real world, we can learn about the ways that this is produced in real world settings. It's very difficult to reproduce in a lab or on a survey. Studying situations. The importance of the situation to the study of social life is that it encapsulates all the things that impact our decision making processes. Other social sciences typically focus on predicting what people will do in the future using quantitative methods. Herbert Bloomer argued that we should study people using observation and inspection to go out and observe the world and to integrate those observations to gain some understanding of it. The two sets of ways to study people using this technique include some form of observation or talking to people in the form of interviewing. Observations include many variations. An ethnography is the systematic study of a group. You can be an outsider of the group, a non-member, or you can be an insider, either pretending to be a member or simply being a member but making note of social dynamics for a study. What are you studying? Well, that depends on your project, but it typically involves understanding the rules and motivations of the group, why they do what they do. An autoethnography is simply the application of ethnography from the first person perspective. You simply tell your story as you're going through an event in your life and use theory and research to guide your analysis of the situation. Start studying people now. There are at least two ways that you can start studying people now with no money or support whatsoever. First, there is the autoethnography. As per the last slide, autoethnography is simply the application of ethnography from the first person perspective. Is there some aspect of your life that is unique and you think would help other people understand the social world a little bit better? Maybe you have a characteristic that people associate with you, for instance, a missing limb. If so, explore that aspect of your life. Take notes after you interact with people, how they relate to you with that characteristic. How do you feel as you're interacting with other people? Another way to get started with an ethnography is what might be called a flash or instant ethnography. I bet some of you do that right now. Have you ever been at a party or a public area and started noticing interactions between people? The ways that women and men relate to each other, argue or gossip? This is the start of a flash ethnography. The next step to make it more scientific or empirical is to pick the things that you want to focus on and take notes about them. What exactly do you want to observe about women's and men's behaviors? 
Is that is it the words that they exchange, the body language? Make sure to take notes about those things you see afterwards. Those notes become your data. Qualitative interviewing. We all do qualitative interviewing every day. When you ask someone, how are you doing? That is like a qualitative interview question. Think about this. Add your answers to the question, how are you doing in a day? What are the responses you get? If most of them are positive, what does that say about you, people? Maybe it means that people are happy or sad as a whole. How might you extend your research project to see if your assessment is real? Maybe you can ask people more in-depth questions or ask a wider variety of people. You might get different responses then. Most studies that rely on qualitative interviewing are much more focused on particular issues. It might be an assessment of people's experience on the job or examining the impacts of glo the global pandemic on people's everyday lives. You would likely ask anywhere from 20 to 40 people, or maybe more, the same questions and recording responses. When you start hearing the same answers again and again, it's probably a good sign that you have all the data you need to answer your research question. Going into the field. A good qualitative study may take months or even years to complete because it requires a lot of planning, and if you really want to get to know people, you have to build relationships. Like any relationship, that may take time. What kind of relationships are you building? First, you must find people who are willing to let you study them, and then you must build trust with them that you're not intending to do them any harm, either physically or emotionally. Most of the time, this means that you won't share someone's identity or defame them in any way. Planning involves deciding in advance what you plan to observe, the people you plan to talk to, and the schedule for doing all of this. Do you plan to live with the group you're studying? If so, how many days or weeks or months are you planning to live with them? What will you be watching for in this group? Its gender dynamics? If so, what specific behaviors will you be looking for? With regard to sampling, this issue is more important for interviews. How many interviews do you, do you intend to obtain? This can be driven by theory or practicality. If you're studying a group of 10 people, you will likely interview all of them. If it is a large group, such as a factory, you may settle on a couple of dozen out of the hundreds you interact with. That said, what characteristics might you be looking for? It may be that you want to talk to both managers and workers, but maybe your study is more about the workers, so you focus just on them. The important thing is that you have to think about all of these things in advance before you actually start your study and go into the field. Conclusions. I want to finish this lecture by challenging you, you to consider what it means to be scientific and empirical. Anything becomes empirical when you go out and observe something and record your observations. It becomes scientific when you start obtaining systematic measurements. There is no rule that says that these observations have to be in the form of numbers. From one perspective, the qualitative methods reviewed in this chapter are a form of scientific study like any other, except they rely on words, either written observations or verbal responses to your questions, rather than numbers on a survey or an experiment. In this sense, these studies can be thought of in some way as any other scientific study. I suspect that some of you will have some reluctance accepting qualitative research as a scientific study. If you are one of those people, consider the value of qualitative research in a totally different way. In this perspective, qualitative research is a tool to study things that are nearly impossible to do with surveys or experiments, the most common forms of social science. How might you use an experiment to study the lives of illegal drug dealers or experiences of people going through personal tragedy? As I said at the beginning of this lecture, you may be able to do a survey or experiment in these situations, but it would never fully reproduce the thoughts and feelings of the people going through those events. Most importantly, qualitative methods like ethnographies and interviews are a way to see multiple layers of meaning that exist in each and every interaction we have each day. You may ask yourself, what do people really think of me or some other aspect of life? Qualitative methods helps us to get at the meanings that people share combined with those they do, they do not share. In some cases, these methods can help us see the meanings that exist that people are not even aware of. 
In these cases, qualitative methods are not only useful, but the only real way to access meaning and meaning-making in society.